My name is Joseph Hare. I am uh, chairman of the Armed Services Committee here at the Union League, which has nothing to do with this event, but makes these surroundings very familiar for me. And um, I, I would introduce myself as also saying that I'm a fan of Colleen Sheehan's, and, and I've been involved with her building of this organization uh, for the past several years. And that is uh, the Ryan Center at Villanova. I'm a Villanova graduate. And so interested uh, as an alum of the political science department there in these kinds of academic pursuits that are difficult, if not impossible, to get off the ground because uh, the business world uh, generally operates on what they call return on investment. And the return on investment for academic pursuits is difficult, if not impossible, to measure. And perhaps the reason it's that difficult is because it is priceless. Education, and especially the education of our youth, is a priceless commodity. And no one's more adept at it uh, in, in educational matters than Villanova University. And I know that from a long relationship with the university and being involved in its alumni affairs. So for me, this evening kind of brings together my affection for the Union League that is, in the end, um, not just a, a business club, but also a patriotic organization that supports things like a study of the life of Lincoln and a study of uh, those elements that are very rare in our society, like patriotism, and love of country and a dedication to something outside of oneself. So it's a pleasure for me to be here this evening. And my next pleasure is to introduce the president of Villanova University. Uh, Father Donnie and I kind of met um, some years ago when he was the chaplain of the NROTC unit at Villanova. And being a uh, veteran of the Navy and involved with uh, supporting the education of uh, our newest members of the Navy that come through Villanova University, University of Pennsylvania, and other institutions here in the Delaware Valley. Uh, I would attend regularly the fall and spring uh, reviews of the students as they present themselves. Uh, and here comes Father Donahue, who is the chaplain of the unit. and. Uh, Learned about his uh, love of the theater at Villanova. Learned about his uh, love of the university and of education. And like as not, uh, the good rise to the top. And he is selected to be president, uh, the 32nd president of Villanova University. He is now in, uh, in his uh, second year as president and has engaged in a number of different initiatives to improve the university to green the campus, uh, to extend the university out into the community. And I can tell you that he has the personality for it. I don't know if he'll exhibit that tonight, but uh, <laughs> being in the theater department for that many years, he can't help himself. So we might see some of that. But uh, certainly, it's been a pleasure to watch him uh, grow into the, the job of president and to lead university uh, into the, this millennium. Uh, to extend the university into the lives of the students and into the lives of the alumni and bring sort of a, a, uh, an outgoing personality into that process. Uh, for those of you that know him, I'm sure that uh, he's already endeared himself to you in many ways. And I'm sure that as he moves through his leadership at the university, he will continue to touch the lives of both the students, the alumni, the faculty in ways that are, are different and special. Uh, according to his own way of doing things. So uh, please uh, help me to welcome Father Donahue and uh, listen to his remarks. Thank you. And on behalf of Villanova University and the Matthew Ryan Center at Villanova University, I welcome all of you here tonight. Uh, when I arrived, uh, the talk was still going on and we were down on the first floor and a couple of people started trickling out and they said, um, where's the reception? 
it's upstairs on the next floor, and look for a statue of Lincoln. <laughs> and we started looking for a statue. There was a portrait of Lincoln. There was a bust of Lincoln. There was another statue. Of, there was a small statue of Lincoln. There was a big statue of Lincoln. <laughs> The entire building is something of Lincoln. <laughs> so it, was, uh, it wasn't an easy place to find, but uh, I was glad I did. And it is incredible that we're actually in this building here on his uh, birthday. So it, it's, it, as you might are well aware of, if you've listened to KYW all day long, uh, they kept announcing that this was his birthday. And we've celebrated him a lot this year. Our present president has invoked his name several times and his legacy. And it is an important legacy for the United States. But the one thing I remember most about him and growing up and the stories that you hear about Lincoln and all of the things about him was he, he had a, a great love of education. And I also heard this morning on uh, NPR that he had a southern accent, which surprised me. Um, there was a professor at, uh, I think, LaSalle University that said he was from Kentucky. He had a Kentucky accent. so. That was kind of, I never expected that. I always thought the, the man from Springfield, Illinois, uh, which is pretty south if you've ever been in Illinois. But he also had a great love of education. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us as we celebrate his birth and his legacy here to really focus on the idea of education. Because uh, his movement towards uh, his desire to unite this country in a very special and different way, uh, really ask people to kind of look past their own individual desires and their own individual needs and really to look at a bigger picture, a picture of what this country could be and should be and what all men and women in this country should experience and what the opportunities were for them here. And so that I, that's how, when I think of the, the man of Abraham Lincoln, that's who I think of. Uh, somebody who really called people to think outside of themselves and to think in a bigger picture. And that's what we try to do in our educational mission. Uh, we try to ask people to think bigger. We try to ask people to move out of their own individual worlds to really begin to transform themselves into something different and to be something different. And so I'm very pleased that Villanova University is part of this. And one of the exemplary graduates of our university who did that was Matthew Ryan, who served this country, served the state, uh, was an alum of the university, and uh, used his education to really better the lives of so many other people. So as we <clears throat> joined together Abraham Lincoln and Matthew Ryan in a very special way, both uh, servants of this country, both individuals who were able to unite people in a very different way and knit them together in, in a very different way. It's, it's appropriate that we join together in this celebration. And I would just <clears throat> ask all of us to take a moment and ask God to bless this gathering that we are about to share in. Father, you are the source of all that is good. We praise and give you thanks as we join together in celebration this evening. Through numerous moments in our lives, we are reminded of your presence through the many people we encounter. We are strengthened by the gift of their friendship in our lives and are nourished by their generous spirits. Through them, we recognize our responsibility to answer the needs of others, and we become more aware of Augustine's call to join together in community in order to find our way to God. Tonight, we reflect on the legacy of Abraham Lincoln. And we pray that you continue to bless the people of this country, those that govern, and those who labor to wrap us in a fabric woven with threads of justice and peace. We ask your blessing on those who have contributed their time and talents to building and extending our educational mission of transforming them, our minds and our hearts. We give you thanks for the many ways that you have stepped beyond our, themselves to serve us for the ways that they have helped others to achieve new levels of their personal or professional development, and for the creative ways that they have contributed to the culture of Villanova University and to society. And we remember it tonight in a special way, Matthew Ryan, for he was one of those people. We ask you to bless this meal that we are about to share for all those who have spent time to prepare this celebration. May we continue to live the legacy of Lincoln and call our brothers and sisters to freedom. Amen.
Professor Alan Guelzo uh, is our speaker this evening. He received his MA and PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania, as well as a Master's in Divinity from Philadelphia Theological Seminary. He holds an honorary doctorate in history from Lincoln College in Illinois, appropriately. Professor Guelzo is the Henry R. Luce Professor of the Civil War Era and Professor of History at Gettysburg College. Prior to that, he was with the Templeton Honors uh, College at Eastern College just down the road um, from Villanova. His book, Abraham Lincoln, Redeemer President, which was published in 2005, and his book, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, The End of Slavery in America. Both of these books won the Lincoln Prize and the Abraham Lincoln Institute Prize, making him the first double Lincoln laureate in the history of both prizes. He most recently published, just to keep to the theme of Lincoln, Lincoln and Douglas, The Debates That Defined America in 2008, and in 2009, Abraham Lincoln as a Man of Ideas. Professor Guelzo's topic this evening is Abraham Lincoln and the Transatlantic World of Ideas. We are fortunate indeed to have such a distinguished scholar on Lincoln here with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Professor Alan Guelzo. Thank you, Colleen, and my thanks also to the Ryan Center and to Villanova University for the opportunity to be with you this evening. It is the 200th birthday of Abraham Lincoln, and we have been waiting for this for quite a while, working up towards it, Lincolnites arranging events, including here at the Union League. It reminds me a little bit of the fervor that overcame many Russians in 1998 as Russia was approaching the bicentennial of the birth of Alexander Pushkin. Now, Pushkin is the, the Shakespeare of Russia. Uh, ordinary Russians can recite chunks of Pushkin's uh, Evgeny Onyegin off by memory. That's how close Pushkin is to the national identity of Russia. Well, coming up to the anniversary of Pushkin's birthday was a great thing in Russia. And so from 1994 onwards, you began to hear, well, it's only four years till Pushkin's birthday. And then it was, well, it's only three years until Pushkin's birthday. Then only two years until Pushkin's birthday. Only a year, only eight months, on and on, and on like that, till Pushkin's birthday. Until finally it got so thick that a cartoon appeared in a Russian newspaper showing uh, Mr. Pushkin and a pregnant Mrs. Pushkin, and she is saying to him, it's only nine months till Pushkin's birthday. <laughs> Some of us, I think, on that score are actually gonna be quite relieved that we have finally got to February 12th, 2009, and are grateful that there can only be one Abraham Lincoln bicentennial of his birth. But before the day ends and the hours do flee away, we have one more consideration of Abraham Lincoln. And this time, I think appropriate to the Ryan Center, it is a connection about ideas, and it is a connection which is international in its scope. Because Abraham Lincoln had connections which extended much further beyond the immediate confines of what we consider American political thought and American political life, and it's to those considerations that I'd like to turn our attention this evening. Why is there a Lincoln statue in Westminster? Not in Westminster Abbey exactly, but in the city and located across from Parliament Square. It's not exactly in Parliament Square along with Peel and Smuts and other figures who belong to the history of Britain and its Commonwealth. It's across the street where at this moment construction scaffolding has all but obscured the Lincoln statue from view. It's actually, as a statue, one of the more recent additions to the collection of parliamentary statuary all around the Houses of Parliament, not being installed until 1920 as a gift of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. But the statue did not get there easily. 
The statue which looks out over Parliament Square today is a copy of the classic Augustus St. Gordon's Standing Lincoln, whose original stands in Lincoln Park in Chicago. But the initial plan for a Lincoln statue across from Parliament Square had been George Gray Barnard's more rough-hewn, homespun Lincoln. That is, until Robert Todd Lincoln, the only surviving member of Lincoln's immediate family, denounced the Barnard statue as beastly, grotesque, and simply horrible. The only fact which Robert Todd Lincoln thought that Barnard had seemed interested in capturing was the image of a tall splitter of rails born near Hodgenville, Kentucky. And Robert, chagrined at the thought that this was the image destined to be fixed in every mind that crossed Parliament Square, campaigned vigorously to have the Barnard Lincoln replaced by the more statesmanlike St. Gordon's. And so it was. Perhaps Robert Todd Lincoln was driven by other anxieties, though, than just aesthetics. Because Robert Todd Lincoln had served as American minister to the court of St. James from 1889 to 1893, and he could well remember from his youth during the Civil War the kind of ridicule Britain had poured out on his father as beastly, grotesque, and simply horrible. To say he is ugly is nothing, chuckled Edward Dicey of the Spectator after meeting Lincoln in 1862 while to add that his figure is grotesque is to convey no adequate impression. You would never say he was a gentleman. Other Britons decided that Lincoln was nothing but a rail splitter, a bargee, a country attorney, and if he did have skill of any sort, he has not yet shown much of it, and certainly he more than once has shown himself outgeneraled. As sympathetic, as William Michael Rossetti, one of the founders of the Pre-Raphaelites, was to Lincoln, he too had to concede that in Britain, people were slow to believe in the possibility of Lincoln's competence for his post. Because he rose from the populace to his great elevation, they inferred that he was a boor and a bungler. Now they were quite ready to write him off as blundering and grotesque. Now, partly this British attitude arose from what the principal American magazine of opinion, the Atlantic Monthly, dismissed as the childish ignorance of English pundits, from John Lambert to Francis Trollope, on the subject of Republican manners and morals. But another part arose from what must be conceded as the entirely accurate perception that Abraham Lincoln represented everything which was the diametric opposite of a hierarchical and aristocratic society. Lincoln, in the eyes of the London Times, was a piece of that common, useful clay out of which it delights the American electorate to make great Republican personages. But such personages, obviously, had no just role in the governance of a real empire. Just as disturbing to the British elite was the connection they saw between Lincoln and Britain's maverick liberal Democrats, Richard Cobden, John Bright, and the other paladins of the Manchester School. Because Lincoln stood out not only as a sign of the uncouthness of liberal democracy in America, but of liberalism's transatlantic and international network of ideas in the 19th century. It has been a commonplace to regard Lincoln as a singularly American figure. It has been equally commonplace to think of American liberal democracy as an exceptional development. And in some cases, that has been precisely what Americans themselves have thought. But as the case of Abraham Lincoln will indicate, it is also wrong. One speaks cautiously about 19th century liberalism. First, because like Alfred de Musset's fictional blockheads, Dupuis and Cotonet, who spent years racking their fuzzy-witted brains to discover that there was no way that they could define romanticism, we could, in similar fashion, come up with as many definitions of liberalism in the 19th century as there were liberals. 
John Stuart Mill, in fact might, fact, might be said to have embraced all of the definitions at different points in his life. And Giuseppe Mazzini bowed so far to the left of liberalism that he even sent a delegation to the First International. But there is another caution in the path of understanding liberals, liberalism and liberal democracy in the 19th century. For the fact that liberalism always seems to be treated by European and British historians like a visit from an eccentric relative, welcome at the beginning as an improvement on the routine, but soon proving too self-absorbed to be welcome for long. <laughs> and yet, looked at in the longest view, liberalism, and I'm using the term in its classic form, not in the homegrown garden variety way of speaking that we have today, liberal versus conservative. Let's erase that, at least for this evening's proceedings. Liberalism in the 19th century, in its classic form, was nothing more or less than the political application of the Enlightenment. As John Stuart Mill said, the philosophes of the 18th century were the example we sought to emulate and we hoped to accomplish no less results. Mazzini, likewise, lauded the 18th century, too generally regarded as an age of mere skepticism and negation, because it denied the inert past. It denied feudalism, aristocracy, monarchy. And so the philosophes begat the physiocrats, who begat Adam Smith and David Ricardo, who begat Jeremy Bentham, the Mills, Père et Fils, Cobden, John Bright, Charles Pelham Villers, James Wilson and the Economist, John Eliot Cairns of University College London, and Goldwyn Smith. Cobden saw his task as becoming one of the leading executors of that legacy of economic science which the Scottish philosophers of the last century had bequeathed. And he especially admired David Ricardo for arguing against meddling with any of our commercial agreements by government, because government was the creature of monopoly. Liberalism's basic argument, like Newtonian physics, was that political economy is not a mystery handed down from the heavens to a certain anointed few, like kings or dukes or princes. Nor is political economy an unchangeable river of experience which cannot be altered or damned. And liberalism proposed that people should not be considered as born like medieval peasants with a certain unchangeable status which they must bear through life, noble or common, saved or damned, slave or free. People instead are born with rights, certain inalienable rights, as Thomas Jefferson put it in the Declaration of Independence. Rights which they must be free to exercise as a natural aspiration of their humanity. From the replacement of status with rights sprang the replacement of obligation with individual freedom, since individual liberty was essential to the free exercise of those rights. That passion for liberty increasingly took the political form of republics rather than monarchies and middle-class capitalism rather than Tory landowning. Else, everywhere, Alexis de Tocqueville claimed in 1853, the winds of change favored the prevalence of the bourgeois classes and the industrial element over the aristocratic and landed classes. Cobden understood the anti-Corn Law League crusade, not as merely a battle about a customs duty, but as the first serious attempt of a new class to assert its claim to take a foremost place in British life, a struggle for political influence and social equality between the landed aristocracy and the great industrialists. Liberalism's enemy was the irrational yoke of privilege and authority. What a country we live in, exclaimed John Bright, where accident of birth is supreme over almost every description and degree of merit. The German liberal, Johann Jacobi, described continental liberalism in 1832 in the same dualistic colors. 
Two opposing parties, said Jacobi, confronting one another. On the one side, the rulers and the aristocracy, with their inclinations toward caprice and their commitment to old, irrational institutions. And on the other side, the people, with their newly awakened feeling of power and their vital striving toward free development. Cobden, for instance, did not propose to be fooled by the mock philanthropy of the Tory landowners who defended the Corn Laws as a species of agrarian compassion. Nor, with a certain even-handedness, was Cobden disheartened by the sullen uncooperativeness of the Chartists, whom he believed had unwittingly allowed themselves to be seduced by the aristocrats into mistrust of the bourgeoisie. In actuality, the mill owners and the industrialists were the best friends the working class could have, since the Corn Laws, as Cobden warned, actually did more than any Manchester grad grind to degrade and pauperize the laboring classes by doubling the price of food and limiting employment. It was not the aristocratic habits of honor, manners, and condescension which made for the prosperity of empires as well as for that of families, added Alexis de Tocqueville, but the middle class virtues of courage, energy, integrity, foresight, good sense. Courage, integrity, foresight, good sense, but not by a curious omission, religion. Liberalism was not an amoral release into unregulated materialism, nor was it necessarily the enemy of religion. Guizot conceded that time-honored and esteemed truths control man without enslaving him and restrain at the same time that they support him. He can move onward and upward without danger of being carried away by the impetuous flight of his own spirit. But liberalism was no more interested in taking dictation from established churches than it was from classical philosophy or a landed aristocracy. Cobden, who embodied both liberalism's hostility to aristocrats and its passion for measuring merit and talent by middle-class success, offered scanty evidence of anything like an intense spirituality in his nature. He was neither oppressed nor elevated by the mysteries, the aspirations, the remorse, the hope that constitutes religion. The reverence of the liberal for reason weakened the liberal's desire for submission to and conformity with the public manifestations of religion, baptism, the ritual of worship, the sacraments. This, in turn, usually led to an indifference or even hostility to the public privileges Christianity still enjoyed in Europe, and to toleration for dissident forms of religion. Not because the liberal had a fondness for religious underdogs, but because no religion seemed to the liberal to be worth quarreling over. Tocqueville claimed, I respect religion and honor the priest in church, but I will always put him outside of government. But for all that they opposed, liberalism did not consider itself a purely negative collection of ideas. Once turned loose onto the plains of freedom, liberals were confident that there would be no limit on how far the reasonable and humane mind could push the progress of human knowledge and accomplishment. The old fetters of prejudice and routine seemed to be giving way on all sides, John Stuart Mill rejoiced in 1868 promising a much better settlement than the world has yet had. Because liberalism saw itself as the embodiment of reason, humanity, and freedom, it was confident that its own success was irresistible. And that overweening confidence that whatever represented progress also represented the triumph of liberty was the closest thing that liberalism allowed itself to prophecy. Progress trumpeted Mazzini, is the law of God. No one who plows doggedly through the American reviews and journals of the years between 1820 and 1865, through the North American Review, Putnam's Monthly, the American Whig Review, 
can fail to be impressed by the pains they took to keep the movements of European liberalism under scrutiny or to identify themselves with its fate. All believers in a true popular government, announced Harper's Weekly, and in whatever country they live, form the great liberal party of the world. The Atlantic Monthly hoped in 1864 to embrace within our hopes the dawning fortunes of a free Italy and a free Hungary, of Poland liberated, of Greece regenerated, not just a North American manifest destiny. Americans, especially in the free states and among Henry Clay's Whig party, saw a vast mutuality with French and English liberals. They applauded Manchester, this metropolis of manufacture, for its extreme liberal opinions, as though it were a sister city. And they described the repeal of the Corn Laws as the mighty enterprise which revolutionized the politico-economical theories and practices of the most intelligent and opinionated people in Europe and broke the power of the richest and most haughty landed aristocracy of modern time, as though the repeal of the Corn Laws was an echo of Yorktown. For their part, European liberalism saw American liberals as co-workers in the same cause. When France finally got itself a republic again, Alexis de Tocqueville hoped that it will be a republic strongly and regularly constituted like that of the United States. Goldwyn Smith, who took the liberals' admiration for American democracy to its ultimate application by abdicating the Regis Professorship of Modern History at Oxford for a chair in constitutional history at Cornell in 1868, said during his tour of America in 1864, an English liberal comes here not only to watch the unfolding of your destiny, but to read his own. Your regeneration, when it is achieved, will set forth the regeneration of the European nations. John Bright, in particular, was hailed as the undisguised champion of American institutions and staunch supporter of Republican principles. And Bright, frankly, extolled the United States as a laboratory of true liberal democracy, and has always shown himself a staunch friend to the prosperity of the United States. Everywhere there, said Bright about the United States, is an open career. There is no privileged class. There is complete education extended to all. And every man feels that he is not born to be in penury and in suffering, but that there is no point in the social ladder to which he may not fairly hope to raise himself by his honest efforts. In 1865, Harper's Weekly could eulogize Richard Cobden, who had died just weeks before Lincoln's assassination, as the English Lincoln to the extent that Cobden was a self-made man, in this he was like Mr. Lincoln. And Harper's thought that he shared with Lincoln a peculiar energy, clearness, tenacity, and purity of purpose. And this was not mere eulogy, either. Born within five years of each other, both Cobden and Lincoln were alike shaped by the early experience of having their labor appropriated for the benefit of another, in Cobden's case, an uncle, in Lincoln's, his father, and by the denial of educational opportunity. Like Cobden, Lincoln escaped into the world of commerce as soon as he came of age. Cobden made a fortune in textiles, something which eluded Lincoln as a storekeeper in New Salem, Illinois. But Lincoln made up for this by turning to the practice of law, since Lincoln's lawyering, like Cobden's textiles, was overwhelmingly a civil and commercial business. Out of 5,600 cases handled by Lincoln between 1837 and 1861, only 194 involved criminal law, and only 17 of those were high-profile murder cases. By contrast, Two-thirds of Lincoln's legal time was devoted to property actions, many of them connected to the Illinois railroads. Lincoln was not, strictly speaking, a corporate lawyer, but as Henry Clay Whitney admitted, I never found him unwilling to appear in behalf of a great soulless corporation. 
That included the Illinois Central Railroad, in which Cobden had invested and lost heavily. It was as an Illinois Central investor that Cobden actually met Lincoln during Cobden's second American tour in 1859. And though Cobden initially doubted whether Lincoln possessed more than a certain moral dignity, by the end of 1863, Cobden had concluded that Lincoln had solid sense as well as great moral qualities, which were rising in reputation in Europe apart from the success of the North in the Civil War. Lincoln had no such crossing of paths with John Bright, but Lincoln's faith in John Bright was, if anything, even deeper. Pennsylvania Congressman William Kelly remembered Lincoln greeting a visiting delegation of English friends with an inquiry as to the health of John Bright, whom he said he regarded as the friend of our country and of freedom everywhere. Lincoln kept a portrait of Bright in his White House office, and in April 1863, Lincoln had Charles Sumner, the chair of the U.S. Senate's Foreign Relations Committee, forward to Bright a series of resolutions Lincoln hoped that Bright would promote in Parliament, refusing diplomatic recognition to any new nation formed anywhere upon the basis of and with the primary and fundamental object to maintain, enlarge, and perpetuate human slavery. Still, commercial success in either law or business or politics were not ends in themselves for either Cobden and Bright or Lincoln. Cobden pressed himself to master mathematics, Latin, and political economy, and so did Lincoln. John Todd Stewart, Lincoln's first law partner, told a campaign biographer in 1860 that Lincoln had a mind of a metaphysical and philosophical order. Unlike many of his legal peers, Lincoln has made geology and the other sciences a special study and is always studying into the nature of things. A British lawyer, George Barrett, who interviewed Lincoln as president in 1864, was amazed when Lincoln launched off into some shrewd remarks about the legal systems of the two countries and then talked of the landed tenures of England and rounded off the conversation with some commentary upon English poetry, the president saying that when we disturbed him, he was deep in Alexander Pope. John Hay, one of Lincoln's primary presidential staffers, was just as amazed to find himself in a talk on philology with Lincoln, for which the president has a little indulged inclination. Out of all of these interests, though, it was politics, which was Lincoln's heaven. And in echo of Cobden, Shelby Cullum thought that on political economy, he was great. Lincoln, wrote William Henry Herndon, his third and principal law partner, Lincoln liked political economy, the study of it. Significantly, Herndon remembered Lincoln's most intensive book reading, resting on the principal texts of mid-19th century transatlantic liberalism. John Stuart Mill's Principles of Political Economy, Henry Carey's The Harmony of Interests, Agricultural, Manufacturing, and Commercial, and Carey's Principles of Political Economy, and Francis Whelan's Elements of Political Economy. It is not clear whether Lincoln ever read Jeremy Bentham, but the Westminster Review was on the table of periodicals which Herndon remembered from the Lincoln Law Office. And Lincoln didn't mind quoting the most famous Bentamite tagline. Without entering upon the details of the question, Lincoln said in 1861, I will simply say that I am for those means which will give the greatest good to the greatest number. Even in the last weeks of his life, the president, who was usually better known for reading aloud from joke books, reminded the San Francisco journalist Noah Brooks that he was also a lover of many philosophical works, and then reeled off a list of the most influential books in American and British philosophy and politics, including, significantly, John Stuart Mill on liberty. This roster of shared characteristics between Lincoln and English liberalism can be taken for more than a coincidence, starting with liberalism's fundamental rationalist reflex.
John Stuart Mill said that his father, James Mill, had nothing but scornful disapprobation for passionate emotions of all sorts and considered them a form of madness. Mill himself came equipped with a still and even cold appearance and a head that reasons as a great steam engine works. Surprisingly, so did Lincoln. Herndon rebuffed any idea that Abraham Lincoln was a very warm-hearted man, spontaneous and impulsive. Lincoln's strongest faculty instead was his great reason, pure and strong. He lived in the mind and he thought in his life and lived in his thought. David Davis, who had been the circuit judge on Lincoln's old Eighth Judicial Circuit and later Lincoln's appointee to the Supreme Court, added that Lincoln had no spontaneity, no emotional nature, no strong emotional feelings for any person, mankind, or thing. Lincoln lived, said Herndon, mostly in the conscience and the head. And these two attributes of his were the two great ones of his nature, the ruling and predominant ones of his whole and entire life. And it was, of course, Lincoln's appeal to the head rather than the heart, which summed up his hope for a reconciliation of North and South. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection, he pleaded through 1860 and 1861. Let us do nothing through passion and ill temper. Like John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham, Lincoln was philosophically disposed toward determinism. On every occasion, decreed Bentham, conduct, the course taken by a man's conduct, is at the absolute command of, is the never failing result of, the motives which cause it. What gave these motives their power over human willing was the self-interest to which they appealed. On every occasion, said Bentham, an act is at the absolute command of motives and corresponding interest. So, concluded John Stuart Mill, you will never change the people but by changing the external motives which act on them and shape their way of life from the cradle to the grave. Lincoln, too, subscribed to a rigid notion of causality which linked self-interest, motives, and action. His idea, wrote Herndon, was that all human actions were caused by motives, and at the bottom of these motives was self. Lincoln even couched his justifications for his Emancipation Proclamation in the language of motives and self-interest. I thought that in your struggle for the Union, to whatever extent the Negroes should cease helping the enemy, to that extent it weakened the enemy and his resistance to you, he argued to reluctant Democrats in 1863. But that help would never come unless blacks were offered a similar appeal to self-interest through emancipation. Negroes, like other people, act upon motives, said Lincoln. If for the sake of saving the Union, they stake their lives for us, they must be prompted by the strongest motive, even the promise of freedom. Genuine reform, whether from slavery or the Corn Laws, only emerged from recognizing the legitimacy of self-interest on the part of all classes, and in putting no bar in the path of those who sought to make something other themselves than what they had been born to. Well might the young England Tories who fought to the bitter end for the Corn Laws glorify a social order at once romantic and feudal where the greatest owed connection with the least, from rank to rank the generous feeling ran and linked society as man to man. To John Stuart Mill, this was just one more slice of that pseudo-philanthropy whose fundamental object is to promote the idea that in each class it is the other people's business to take care of them. Paternalism of this sort was always hiding an ace up its sleeve. There are governments in Europe who look upon it as part of their duty to take care of the physical well-being and comfort of the people, Mill warned. But with paternal care is connected paternal authority. In one of his most famous and most excoriated speeches, Richard Cobden declared, in what really might have been arrogance in almost anyone else, that I yield to no person in the world, 
in a hearty goodwill toward the great body of the working classes, but mine is that masculine species of charity which would lead me to inculcate in the minds of the laboring classes the love of independence, the privilege of self-respect, the disdain of being patronized or petted, the desire to accumulate, and the ambition to rise. Any of this could have as easily been written by Abraham Lincoln as by Cobden or Mill. Lincoln recalled that he had been a strange, friendless, uneducated, penniless boy working on a flatboat at $10 per month. But behold, the change that an open, liberal economy could fashion. The prudent, penniless beginner in the world labors for wages a while, saves a surplus with which to buy tools or land for himself, then labors on his own account another while, and at length hires another new beginner to help him. In a comment which cut straight across the anti-commercial grain of both the Corn Law aristocrats and the thousand bale planters of the American South, Lincoln remarked, men who are industrious and sober and honest in the pursuit of their own interests should after a while accumulate capital and after that should be allowed to enjoy it in peace. And if they chose, when they had accumulated capital, to use it to save themselves from actual labor and hire other people to labor for them. No one was a better example of this than Lincoln himself. 25 years ago, I was a hired laborer, Lincoln said. The hired laborer of yesterday labors on his own account today and will hire others to labor for him tomorrow. Advancement, improvement in condition is the order of things in a society of equals. Lincoln did not mention that this description of self-advancement seems to have been cribbed word for word from Mill's Principles of Political Economy. Defining equality in economic rather than political terms was what provided the ribbing of Lincoln's opposition to slavery. The leading object of the American Republic, as Lincoln saw it, was to elevate the condition of men, to lift artificial weights from all shoulders, to clear the paths of laudable pursuit for all, to afford all an unfettered start and a fair chance in the race of life. Slavery denied this. Slaves were not designed to be elevated. Slaves were designed to bear weights. Slaves did not need paths to laudable pursuits, and slaves did not need a fair chance in the race of life because slaves were never to be allowed to compete in the race in the first place. To oppose slavery, as Lincoln did, was not a gesture of empathetic compassion, but a statement in favor of economic access, of the opportunity to break loose from the economic stagnation of fixed conditions of labor and improve oneself. Every man, Lincoln said, black, white, or yellow, has a mouth to be fed and two hands with which to feed it, and that bread should be allowed to go to that mouth without controversy. Lincoln wanted every man to have the chance, and I believe a black man is entitled to it, in which he can better his condition, when he may look forward and hope to be a hired laborer this year and the next work for himself afterward, and finally, to hire men to work for him. That is the true system. But was it? For the future certainly did not march with Lincoln, or with Richard Cobden, or with John Bright. Cobden never became part of a cabinet, and at the end of his life, he almost despaired to Bright there are things to be done which you and I could make a so-called liberal government do, but we are comparatively powerless. John Bright, for his part, thought complacently of Manchester as the center and heart of the greatest and most remarkable industry that the world has ever seen. But what the world actually saw was an industrial sewer. Manchester is built and is worked for profit wrote an American magazine in 1857, not for pleasure. Beauty is driven away from her as a thing at variance with practical life. 
It is represented by a thousand tall factory chimneys rising out of a gray mist and surmounted by a heavy drifting cloud of smoke. A city built merely by trade, built for the home of labor, of machines, and of engines, and for the dwelling place, one cannot call it the home, of crowds of human beings whose value is, for the most part, estimated according to their machine-like qualities. If the future marched in any direction, it was the one laid down by Bismarck, who suppressed his own early inclinations toward liberal republicanism in favor of a more subtle and successful strategy which preserved the status of the ruling class by appeasing the restlessness of the industrial working classes through a broad variety of paternalistic state welfare schemes and thus maneuvering the liberal middle classes into political impotence. Bismarckian Germany created the 19th century's third way, that of a working class co-opted by an aristocracy, and who in exchange for the securities of state paternalism accepted an alliance whose chief result was to keep the restless middle classes securely locked in their productive cages with a guardian on both sides. Give the working man the right to employment as long as he has health, declared Bismarck, assure him of care when he is sick and maintenance when he is old, and he will become the best friend of the state. The socialists will sound their bird call in vain, Bismarck predicted, and the middle classes will have no leverage to challenge the privileges or the status of the rulers. Curiously, no one saw the cynical appeal of Bismarck's Germany more clearly than the man who had Europe's greatest contempt for it, Karl Marx. Support for cooperative societies from the Royal Prussian government, wrote Marx to Johann Baptist Schweitzer in February 1865, is of no value whatever as an economic measure. Instead, politically, it extends the system of tutelage corrupts a section of the workers and castrates the movement. Marx foresaw that the Workers' Party will discredit itself far more if it imagines that in the Bismarck era the golden apples will drop into its mouth by the grace of the king. But he complained to the same purpose as Cobden. Disraeli, likewise, prophesied that the Public Health Act would gain and retain for the conservatives, meaning the Tories, the lasting affection of the working classes. In the process, liberalism's reputation was ruthlessly reduced to individualism and individualism to cupidity. A century and a half later, little has changed about that perception. Liberal democracy, is still treated with condescension and spurned even by American historians in favor of locating American identity in a Republican synthesis or in the beloved community or in the Habermasian public sphere. But I suspect that liberalism's real beam in the eye was not a heartless Weberian rationalism, but its hostility to restraint its hostility to the condescension which believes that people will not and cannot be left responsible for their own lives, to the replacement of virtue with sensuality, not its indifference to morality, but its persistence in talking about natural law and certain universal truths which were true in all places and for all people. To be a liberal in the classic sense was to think about Europe, about the world. I am an Italian, shouted Mazzini, but at the same time, I am a European. Mazzini's faith was not in a crude spirit of nationalism, but in the spirit of nationality, in which the cause of the peoples is one cause. Universal truths, however, have long since had the postmodern derision of differentialism heaped upon it. Yet I am not sure that universal is a poorer word in the long run than fatherland or UMA. 
The St. Gordon's standing Lincoln, which overlooks Parliament Square, is an older, preoccupied statesman, eyes cast downward as though in uncommunicative thought. Perhaps Robert Todd Lincoln's instinct then was appropriate, for the Lincoln in Westminster is a distant, resigned, and respectful Lincoln, respectful of the divide that separates him from Peel, Palmerston, Disraeli, and Darby. Perhaps the George Gray Barnard statue was too much a reminder of another Lincoln, the aspiring, upwardly ambitious Lincoln, the commercial lawyer, the unbowed liberal Democrat. The Barnard statue, though, did manage to make its way to England, not to London and not to Parliament Square, but to Manchester. The sentiment of London was quite against the northern states, explained the Lord Mayor of Manchester at the statue's unveiling there in 1919. But Lincoln found in John Bright and Cobden and in all the men of affairs in Manchester warm friends and sympathizers. And for that reason, he said, we are very grateful. Maybe Lincoln's happier there, after all. Thank you very much. I know it's late, but I wondered if you would be willing to entertain a couple of questions. Thank you, Alan. Yes. How do you connect Mill and, and Bentham on the one hand with natural law on the other? Oh, I don't. Not Mill and Bentham, no. I, again, liberalism is a very, very large elephant. There are many joints, many pieces, many parts, not all of which inhabited the same space comfortably. Uh, Comden and Bright were the greatest of friends. They dovetailed perfectly. Yet Comden and Bright never had a terribly close association with Mill, or with any of the other Bentamites. Yet, on the other hand, they do tend to occupy this same rather larger category of people who were resistant to the irrational, resistant to irrational forms of authority like inherited kingships and monarchy, and hostile to restraint, the artificial restraints imposed by government or monopoly on the enterprise of individuals and of businesses. In that respect, the term liberal does belong to all of them, although it is a, it, it's a rubber band with a lot of expansiveness. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, if it's fair to say that British liberalism, in contrast to British evangelicalism, would never have abolished slavery, to what extent is it still to create the inference and connection between Lincoln and British liberalism? Well, because I think in a very real sense that American liberal democracy, you know, conceived of strictly in the terms that Lincoln was conceiving of it, uh, would probably never have gotten to the point of abolishing slavery either had it not been for American evangelical energies, which put their shoulder to the wheel. The abolition of slavery in the British Empire then the repeal of the Corn Laws, along with the abolition of slavery in the United States, was always the work of a coalition. Now, it was a coalition which had certain valences. You had very secular people like Lincoln. You had people whose inspiration and his motivation was clearly religious among many of the abolitionists. Sometimes they spat tax at each other. But nevertheless, they were all working at pushing the same wagon along. And that could happen. There were, in other words, between certain kinds of ideas, that are not exactly the same, there are nevertheless valences that allow them to cooperate. And the same thing is true in Britain. So that secular liberals of the sort like Richard Cobden could cooperate in the tearing down of the Corn Laws and find a lot of sympathy from evangelicals. Again, not because they were identical, but because there were these valences. Both evangelicals in their, in, in, I'm thinking here especially British evangelicals, British evangelicals, in their struggle against the formality and the authoritarianism of the Church of England, 
found allies, so to speak, with those politically who were also struggling against the formalism and the hidebound nature of British uh, hierarchicalism and especially British aristocracy. Wouldn't be, of course, the first time that such valences or alliances had been struck up. In the 17th century, the Puritan party in England and the parliamentary party. Again, there were overlaps, there were valence, not, not identity, but they worked together. And Parliament and Puritanism put together, you know, Oliver Cromwell and John Hampton uh, gave us the English Revolution. So it was very much a matter of coalitions. Uh, again, liberalism, a very broad-based phenomenon. It takes in a number of different kinds of people, but mixed together at a particular historical time and the power that it demonstrated for moving what seemed to be unmovable political and social structures was really considerable. Yes? I wonder if your um, critique of Lincoln's uh, defense of the Emancipation Proclamation as one of economic purpose confuses um, rationale for the moral purpose that I think underlie. I mean, he, he was very cognizant of the limits on his constitutional authority, and that's a much grander design than you, I think, attributed to him. And, and if you're right about what, what he was trying to accomplish, he could have just as easily issued an Emancipation Proclamation that was nationwide because people who are free in the North would contribute to the war effort equally. But he thought that was beyond the realm of his constitutional authority, and I was always very cognizant of those lines. Oh, yes, but, yes. But, but, but I think your, your, your treatment of it just kind of writes it off as kind of economic utilitarianism. I don't think that does a, a service to it. Well, there, there is a certain book of about 464 pages in length which, which makes precisely the argument that Lincoln's movement towards emancipation was always very clearly conditioned on the legal niceties and on Lincoln's profound respect for the boundaries set by the Constitution. And I won't, I won't tell you what the title of that book is, even though it's called Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of <laughs> Slavery in America. Because um, I, I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm being self-interested. Um, <laughs> On the other hand, Lincoln frequently makes the appeal to self-interest, not curiously enough about the proclamation. You know, this is one of the odd things. Lincoln is not a philosopher. He's not a faculty member. It's, he has no imperative to create consistent skeins of thought that can appear in his systematic political thought. Uh, and he will feel free at times to move in directions that you scratch your head a little bit and wonder where did they come from. So on the one hand, when in the letter that he writes, the public letter for James Conkling at the Springfield Mass meeting uh, on September 2nd, 1863, there his argument is couched entirely in self-interest. We justify the Emancipation Proclamation because it will help us to win the war, and if we're going to have black soldiers help us win the war, we have to appeal to their self-interest. Okay. But on the other hand, when he sits down with his cabinet on September 22nd, 1862, and says to them, here's the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm going to issue this. And the reason I'm going to issue this is because I made a vow to God, and now I have to fulfill it. All right, I want to digest that for a moment. Here's the President of the United States about to issue the most socially revolutionary document that any president has ever issued, sitting with this group of hard-boiled professional politicians, and is quite seriously looking them in the eye and telling them, I'm doing this because I made a vow to God. And you can just about hear the jawbones clattering on the floor. Uh, in fact, one, of the member, one member of his cabinet actually asked Lincoln to repeat himself because he couldn't believe what he was hearing. So Lincoln will justify emancipation, yes, exactly in that moral imperative. We have to do the right thing. But at the same time, he'll also critique the people who push that to the extreme of saying, we must do right though the heavens fall. That was the Garrisonian abolitionists. In fact, Lincoln in 1848 actually directly criticized that. People, he said, who adopted the view that you must do justice though the heavens fall are people who have decided that reason should play no role whatsoever in politics. And that really lies at, at the root of much of the structure of his political thinking. So I, I by no means exclude the moral imperative that Lincoln appeals to. Uh, on the other hand, what is true is at the same time as there is a moral appeal in Lincoln, there is also very much the appeal to rational economic self-interest. Do the two necessarily go together? Well, no. But are they necessarily hostile to each other? 
No. Can they exist within the mind of one politician? Oh, boy, let's not underestimate the expansive power of politicians' minds. Uh, <laughs> they can embrace a number of things. Who was it in the 19th century? It was, it was, said, it was said of Charles Kingsley that he could, be, he could believe eight impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> what a politician he would have made. So, yeah, I take your point, but it's also, as I'm trying to draw connections to English liberalism, what I'm doing is highlighting the specific aspects of Lincoln, which, which will connect him that way. And if you would like to, to stay here until 4 o'clock in the morning, I will be happy to go into all the other details. But you know, space and time, they do these nasty things to you. Yes? If I could follow up on that, how would, it, how would Lincoln have understood the last true measure of devotion in connection with his understanding of self-interest? Devotion is linked to dedication. That's what he's talking about in Gettysburg. What's at stake in the Gettysburg Address? Founders created this republic dedicated to a proposition. It's not like European nations founded on race or blood. The American Republic is founded on a proposition that all men are created equal. Now we're involved in this civil war. It's testing whether a nation founded on a proposition uh, will not automatically blow its brains out uh, the moment a challenge uh, is offered to it. Our democracy is so inherently weak, so inherently unstable, when you let people disagree in public, uh, doesn't it automatically guarantee that sooner or later everything's going to fall in like a house of cards? And Lincoln says, look, the dedication of the people who died here is proof that that's, that's not necessarily the case. Democracy is not foredoomed. But then what does he say? He does not enter into a, a, a lengthy discussion about the nature of dedication. He then turns to the audience. He says, rather, it's for us, the living, to be dedicated to the same proposition. In other words, he's asking for a rational response. Here's a proposition. Let's be dedicated to it. If we do that, then we'll ensure that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. He, he's not making an emotional appeal. The, the Gettysburg Address is a remarkably unemotional document. What he's asking for is dedication to the proposition. If we do that, then democracy, government of the people, by the people, for the people, uh, will not perish. Uh, that's a rational exercise. And it speaks to a man for whom, as he once said many years before that, reason, cold, calculating reason, must be our guide. Do you really mean to say that what moves you is unemotional? What moves you is unemotional. Well, it depends on what you mean by move. To move, to move is to respond to a motivation. It is to respond to a motive. A motive force. All right. Now, that motive force can either be internal or external. The motive force can be me wrestling you to the ground and robbing you of your wallet, OK? That's, that's motivation. If I put that gun to your head and say, stand and deliver, that's, that's a big motivation. I mean, I'd feel motivated. Um, so what moves you, then, is emotion? What moves me? That would be telling. I came here to talk about Lincoln. I didn't come here to talk about Lincoln. Lincoln's interesting. I'm, listen, Lincoln, Lincoln is interesting. If you, wanna, if you want my autobiography, uh, that, that's sold along with you know, certain prescriptions for uh, you know, people who can't sleep at night. Yeah, yes? It's often said that Lincoln was not so much motivated by individual liberalism as, uh, or liberal individualism as he was by national unity. Is, is there anything, uh, is, is that a contradiction or not? That the well, timing of the emancipation was, was motivated more by a strategy for what uh, would maintain? For, for Lincoln, emancipation and national reunification were simply two sides of the same coin. Why did the southern states secede from the Union? Why did they try to break up national unity? It wasn't because they woke up one day and said, boy, this national unity stuff is really old. You know, let's do something really radically different and have some fun. Um, no, I mean, they, they leave the union because Lincoln's election as president is the handwriting on the wall. And it says no longer is the South going to have the whip handle politically in uh, American politics, that from now on, an anti-slavery northern president can be elected without getting a single electoral vote from the South. And that means we're never going to have a pro-Southern president again. It's always going to be a procession of northern anti-slavery men, because they can be elected just by northern votes. Uh, so the Southerners look at that and they say, OK, that's the end for us. We better get out while the getting's good. Because if we don't get out now, if we wait around, 
then the whole pressure of the federal government is going to be brought against us to emancipate slaves and we will find ourselves up a creek without a paddle. So let's get out now, let's cut our losses with the Union and leave. Why do people break up the Union? To protect slavery. Why does Lincoln want to restore the Union? Because it is by restoring the Union he guarantees the destruction of slavery. When, when people try to separate the two and say, oh, Lincoln was only interested in you know, restoring the Union, he was not interested in freeing the slaves. If that was really the case, I mean, if there, if there really was a wedge driven between his right and left brain on this subject, then why would he have ever bothered with emancipation? He did not need emancipation to reunite the nation. He needed military victories in the field. He needed to get rid of George McClellan. That's what he needed to do. There was no great political mass out there twisting his arm, forcing him to the wall, beating on him and saying, if you don't emancipate the slaves, we aren't going to vote for you. No such constituency existed. The abolitionists were a tiny minority. And as for free blacks in the North, most of them couldn't vote at all. That's not what I would call a powerful political constituency. If there was a political constituency for anything, it was for doing nothing about slavery. Just aim at restoring the Union. The people who were interested only in restoring the Union, that was George McClellan. But Lincoln understands that if you're going to restore the Union, inevitably you're involving a discussion about slavery. If he really had that separation, he would never have taken the risks he took to emancipate. Because look what happened. He issues the preliminary emancipation in September, the end of September, 1862. Six weeks later, congressional by-elections. His party gets shellacked. Republicans lose 36 seats in the House of Representatives. Now, is that an example of good political calculation? I mean, do you, do you really think it's a good idea to take one of the most unpopular, racially unpopular gestures he could have made, do it six weeks before the election, and then this is supposed to be an indication that he's lukewarm on the subject? No, actually, I think to the contrary. Uh, it meant that all along, from the very first, he had understood that his presidency was going to lead, inevitably, by some long track, but by some track, towards emancipation. So I, I, there just really is not a split between the two. Preserve the Union is emancipation. Emancipation requires preservation of the Union. Please join me.